participate. So we're really happy to have Katrina with us today. So why don't you, um, before you jump in and start your discussion about recycling, Katrina, why don't you tell, your, tell them a little bit about yourself and what you do at EcoMan. Well, hi everyone. Thanks so much for spending a little time with us this morning. Um, I have been working for EcoMain for the past five years. Um, it is my dream job. I uh, graduated from college in 2017, or sorry, 2007, and got this job in 2016. So it actually took about 10 years to, to find this particular job. Um, and I did a lot of really, really, really cool jobs in between that kind of led me on this crazy road to, to what I do now. Uh, but my current position, I um, teach about trash and recycling, to put it simply. Um, I'm kind of one of the faces of EcoMain, um, and we are um, really big on educating folks on where their trash goes, what happens to it, what the end process is, what's cr being created along the way, um, and where their recycling goes, and really why it matters what you put in the bin um, and, and why that matters. So um, uh, that's, that's my job here. So that's um, what I do. Thank you. Um, sorry, someone's cleaning a tarp for me because I'm doing a trash audit with the main Celtics on Sunday. Um, and instead of just throwing out the tarp uh, that we use for the trash audit, I have them clean it because of course I'm in the whole don't throw it away business. So, um, so yeah, we, we really focus on education and uh, today we're just gonna learn about uh, a little bit about trash, a little bit about recycling, a little bit, bit about food waste, and then of course some, some fun holiday thoughts uh, for, for having a more sustainable holiday. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely hear and learn from Katrina and then we'll have an opportunity for uh, to ask questions and then just have um, some dialogue and you know, see what people wanna talk about. So take it away, Katrina. Okay, so I pretty much nerded out when I knew that I was gonna do this and I completely forgot to look at the, I have five to 10 minutes um, to speak and then we have Q and A after that. So I actually created like a 42 slide program, which I'm going to turn into a PDF and then um, send to, to anybody who wants it or everybody. Um, and then you can look at it as you're at your leisure. Um, that PDF will not include videos just because PDFs don't play videos. Um, but you can find any videos that we have online on YouTube. You can search EcoMain virtual or down at the, um, at the end of the program, we're going to talk about holidays. You can search EcoMain holiday on YouTube and any and all of our videos are up there. And of course, we're always happy to help you find them um, if you email us at info at ecomain.org or give us a phone call. So I'm just gonna share my screen with you um, because I have kind of whittled down my presentation to some really interesting slides. And Troy, are you working on letting me share? Audio. All right, here we go. So I've got my slides. So I'm just gonna share some information with you. And of course we'll have plenty of time for Q and A after this, um, but I just wanna share a little bit about uh, who we are, where we are. So if you don't know about EcoMain, we are a nonprofit sustainable waste management company. We're located right by the Portland airport in Portland, Maine. So here's 95, here's Unum, and then the airport's just right over here. So if you've ever seen the stack as you've been driving down 95, that's where your trash goes. We take South Portland, Portland, and then everywhere from um, Waterville to Rockland to Kittery and two um, uh, communities down in the New Hampshire area to Freiburg. So we actually take 68 communities or about 400 or 450,000 folks give us their trash and or recycling. So we're dealing with all that stuff in our recycling building. Single sort recycling here started in 2007 but we were recycling before that. Uh, fun story, this building used to be the trash building. So this is where trash used to come and we used to squish it or bale it and then put it in part of the landfill down here. Um, but now we take your trash and we combust it for electricity, meaning we burn it up, we make it from 100% trash to 10% ash and all along the way creating electricity to power our trash building, power our recycling building, power our two electric cars that we take to programs, and then also power up to 15,000 homes on top of that. So we're making an incredible amount of power as well as making the trash much smaller. If you look down here, we're not a typical landfill with all your trash being smelly and gross. We have ash in our landfill and it's very well managed and very well contained, um, of course, within our, our cells. Um, one more thing we're making up here is pollution. Anytime you burn anything from a pile of leaves to a pile of trash, you're going to create pollution. Um, so 
we of course mitigate that safely inside this building and follow the EPA and the DEP standards, but then go above and beyond that. So say we're allowed to emit a bit, we're actually emitting down here. And I'm happy to share those numbers with you. I just didn't have time to put it in the whole presentation. Um, but anyway, we've got our single sort recycling, we've got our waste energy facility. Within the waste energy power plant room, we actually have a food waste holding area, which is pertinent to South Portland and Portland uh, because we take the food waste from a lot of drop-off locations, which we're gonna talk about later. And of course, there's also the landfill Asheville. Um, so one of the goals of Climate Future is to lower greenhouse gases by at least 80% by 2050. And of course, the gray line here is waste. So if we wanna think about waste, it does take up a chunk of uh, CO2 or greenhouse gas emissions. So we just need to think about our um, role in the waste systems and what are we doing with our stuff. Of course, it's also helpful to think about the transportation we're using, the energy we're using, um, the type of agriculture we choose to um, support, whether we're buying organic or not. But just wanted to point out waste is um, a kind of a factor as far as um, greenhouse gas emissions. So what can we all do? Let's get familiar with our trash. Yes, we're gonna make trash. We're gonna have pet food bags and pet poo, diapers and uh, syringes, um, if we're diabetic, et cetera, um, uh, chip bags, straws, and just, you know, we're gonna make trash and that's okay. But let's look at that trash and say, is there something that's organic? Can we take it out and put it in a free drop-off location for our food, which we'll talk about in a few minutes? Can we compost it in our own backyard? Do we have a curbside service like Garbage to Garden and we compost it? Are there recyclables in there? Let's take those out and put them in the recycling bin. And are there useful things that others can use? Um, so take those out and give them away. Um, I'm part of a buy nothing group, uh, which is incredible. So I share things and people pick them up for free and people share things. And you know sometimes I pick them up for free. So it's a really wonderful thing. So check out a buy nothing group if you have Facebook um, or there's just ones on the internet as well. So what can you do? Get familiar with your trash, put your organics in the organics bin, recyclables in the recycling bin and give useful things away and throw away your actual trash, but try and keep everything else out. So what are we able to recycle? Let's focus on that for a minute. We all have bins. This is a South Portland bin and a trash bin. In this bin, we want your cardboard of any kind. It could be a shoe box, a cereal box, granola bar box, a box from Amazon. You got a new refrigerator, it's in a box. Put it in the recycling bin. If it's something huge like a refrigerator box, cut that into like half or even fourths, just because our, our facilities, you know, they can't handle absolutely enormous things, especially cardboard. Um, so just be mindful of that. We'll take any paper from your old magazines, junk mail, or even, you know, old craft projects with colored paper. Uh, we'll take the tubing inside your paper towels and your toilet paper. We will not accept your paper towels or your toilet paper in the recycling bin. I just need to make that clear. So no paper towels, those can be composted, but no um, tissues, tape, paper towels or toilet paper in your recycling bin. And also anything from an old lunch bag to um, maybe we get to go uh, from, I don't know, El Rayo or, or Taco Escobar or, or wherever you get takeout from, a lot comes in um, paper bags. So recycle, reuse of course, and then recycle all that paper. Your metals that we wanna recycle are all these types of good things, all this glass, all this plastic. I'm going through quickly because I just wanna make uh, sure we have a lot of time for Q and A. Um, Casey and Troy, tell me if you have these at your town hall and if you don't, I'll get you a big old stack but folks can pick up a do don't list as far as what we take and what we don't take in your recycling bin to help you out at home. Note plastic bags and tanglers, things that can tangle in our machines are the worst, that we hate them. These humans have to get in and cut everything out by hand. So we want you to make sure that we put, are putting the right things in the recycling bin um, and take out all your films, all your bags, anything like this, any filmy stuff and give them back to Hannaford, Shaw's, Target, Walmart, Lowe's, et cetera. So they can go off to Trex decking and other places to turn into decking material, chairs, benches, et cetera. Plasticfilmrecycling.org is your best friend when it comes to your filmy plastics. So check out that website. And of course, this will be in the PDF that I send you. A couple things that are non-recyclable. We need to make sure that people are reminded of this a lot because we get things like these batteries that explode or catch fire in our facilities and cause uh, damage to both equipment and humans. 
Propane tanks can, again, cause fires. Uh, batteries can actually um, uh, completely throw off our magnet that takes out our ferrous metals. Chainsaws, we just don't want them. Sharps and knives can be harmful to our humans. Electronics and uh, you know um, harmful toxic uh, liquids can be very harmful as well, and these can ruin a whole batch of recycling. Food can also ruin recycling because it can you know get smelly and gross in the truck, and then um, just destroy the paper basically. Um, and things like shoes and textiles, these kind of things can get caught in our machines and cause fires too. So humans play a huge role in sorting out the trash out of our recycling. So it's really up to us at home to get the trash, the bad stuff out of the recycling bin um, before it even comes to us. You know, we can deal with a little contamination, but not a lot. Speaking of contamination, hey, South Portland, I just included um, you guys, uh, but of course, South, we uh, contamination from Portland too. This is just a, a random assortment of dates and you can just see the types of contamination we get. Um, if, if this um, uh, row was blank, that would be a good load, but we've got anywhere between five and 25, even 50% contamination sometimes. So, um, you know, no diapers, no um, loose plastic, no bedding, no armchairs, <laughs> crazy stuff that we get. Where does our recycling go? All over the country and then sometimes out of the country. The paper is the only thing that travels overseas sometimes. The plastic never traveled overseas, which is really cool. So people say, oh my God, China's not accepting our plastic anymore. We say, well, that stings for everybody else, but no, uh, Ecomain never sent their plastics overseas. So this is where it's going. Everything is staying in the country or just over the border unless it's paper and sometimes it goes to India, but we've actually been able to send it um, to the uh, Niagara Falls area sometimes and West Virginia sometimes. So that's really great. And we can turn things into great things if we put them in the recycling bin, South Portlanders and everybody else, you might recognize this at Willard Beach. This playground was made out of plastic containers, aluminum cans and soup cans. Of course, toys, sh uh, shirts, bicycles, even toilet paper can be made out of recycled material. And of course, food is not garbage. Please put that food in the uh, compost bins, the food drop-off bins, whether you have a curbside bin, you work with the city of South Portland, or you go and you drop it off somewhere at one of these uh, wonderful sites in just a second, because there's a lot of food in our trash. Um, sorry about the, the non-spacing here, but the average um, study of um, uh, characterization study said that uh, the average human puts about 219 pounds of food into the landfills annually. Again, sorry about that little snafu there. Um, but it's from, you know, it's not just from us and our carrot tops at home. It's discarded at restaurants. It's packaged food that's gone bad. Um, it's even in wash water at the restaurants, fats, oils, and greases, um, and processing waste at, um, at the point of um, growth and all that. So we don't want to fill up our landfills uh, with food. So speaking of those drop-off locations, well, in South Portland, here are your five free drop-off locations. Perhaps you live or work near one of these. So even if you don't have composting at home, you don't want to pay for a composting bucket service at home, you've got these wonderful five drop-off locations in South Portland. I'm so excited about these. And even better, if you live in Portland, they also have one, two, three, four, five different locations here too. So no matter where you uh, work, and again, I'm sorry, this actually should be right here. I reformatted. So um, a couple things are off, but these are correct. Um, but this guy should just be over in Libby Town um, near Portland Water District or the Douglas Pool, Kiwanis Pool, if you've ever been there. So the locations are all down here. And I'll fix that before I send it off. Um, but just one, more, one or two more slides here. Whatever you put in the trash can <laughs> ends up here. So we really wanna make sure that we're putting only trash in the trash can because that recycling is valuable. We can uh, turn that into new things. Your um, food waste is valuable. We can turn that into new and wonderful things. Anything reusable, of course, is valuable to someone else. They can use it. Um, you, this is a study done in 2018 about what is combusted. Um, and and uh, you know, we've got a lot of food that we're putting in there. A lot of metals that could be recycled, a lot of paper that could be recycled, a lot of plastics could be recycled, a lot of yard trimmings that could be composted, uh, textiles that could be recycled through um, apparel impact or other places. So there's a lot of work to be done. So let's uh, let's look at um, what we can do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'll just leave this last slide. It's a, a little one minute thing. Um, so we can talk about the holidays here too.
Howdy, Pico Maine here with fun and conservation themed holiday challenge for you. Challenge one, bring your own coffee mug to reduce disposable cup use and often a reduction in price. Tip two, don't go to the grocery store without your own bags, backpacks, or even purse. Tip three, wrap your presents in co uh, comics, fabric, or even save this year's wrapping for next year's presents. Four, buy local for as many folks as possible. With all the talent Maine has, it's really easy. And finally, five, pack those leftovers in reusable containers for the next meal. Get creative. Try one or all five of these challenges for the holidays or any time of year. And thanks for watching. Find more information at ecomain.org or download our Recyclopedia for answers to about a thousand items. All right, friends. So I am done with my presentation. And I want to open it up to anything that we want to talk about. Thanks, Katrina. That was great. So if you have a question, you can either raise your hand or you know, we're a pretty small group. So also you know, feel free just to unmute and ask your question. Why don't you start off, Mr. Sassafras? <laughs> yeah, hi, uh, Jeff, Jeffrey Hover. I live in Maryland. Um, one question that always seems to be a little confusing. I see confusion conflicting information about caps that are on plastic containers. Do you recycle them or do you throw them out? That's a really good question. And unfortunately to say, it depends on where you live and what your recycling program does because folks buy our recycling from us. So we're at their mercy, which means you're at our mercy because if we can't recycle something, then they can't recycle it. Um, so unfortunately, I just don't know what Maryland does because there's so many different recycling programs over the course of the world. Yeah. Um, so I would 100% check in with your city or town hall to get a list of what you can recycle in your area. Um, at EcoMaine, we say keep the plastic tops on plastic things. So say your laundry detergent jugs, your milk jugs, um, your soda bottles, anything like that. We say keep them on um, and then they can go off and get recycled that way. Um, but some places they don't want the caps so it really is up uh, up to the individual um or the town to educate is it is it a different kind of plastic that they can't recycle is that the issue or well a lot of times it is a different type of plastic so take your milk jug it's a number two but uh, oftentimes the top is number five now i've also heard conflicting information of whenever i sent off that milk jug and this is just me personally not um, the industry there's there someone knows out there but i personally don't at this moment in time but i've heard that when i sent off my milk jug um and all the the um plastic is, is chopped up um the number five will float at a different density than the number two and it's either skimmed away and discarded or skimmed away and you know you've got all these milk jugs together and all this five together and it gets recycled that way Okay. So it, it is a different milk, uh, different um, material. It does um, come out at a different density because it's a different type of, of buoyancy. Um, so that's 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 the answer. Okay, thank you. I choose to believe they are recycled. <laughs> Troy, should I ask you to call or should I? Just call oh, you can go ahead. Go right ahead. Okay. We have lots of great right, questions. I see, uh, Jennifer Morris with your hand up. Hi, Katrina. That was Hi. a great. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry I went through so fast. I just wanted to make sure we had a lot of time. Well, at least you gave us the places to go. So it was yeah. interesting and informative. Thanks. Couple couple points. One, um, what do you do with a broken like glass? What Great you question. So we we actually recently someone got cut with broken glass um, in our facility. Uh, he wasn't wearing the correct kind of gloves, but that still you know kind of highlights a safety issue. Um, we don't want broken glass in our facility. You know, of course, glass is going to break in our facility, but we don't want everyone to send in their broken glass. So I would suggest putting that in it, like sweeping it up, putting it in a bag, and then putting that in your trash. Just and I, that's a huge bummer because glass is not going to. Um, burn down into ash or anything, but you know, we got to think about our, our facilities and our, you know, more, um, more to the point, our people and keep them safe. So that goes in the trash. I just contain it as safely as you're able to. Um, and of course, keeping the, the folks who pick up your, your trash safe too. Okay. And, yeah. and my next issue is I belong to Centerboard Yacht Club. We have about 300 members. Um, we can't get trash picked up. <laughs> because we are, are, we're actually not a business, but we're not a residence. 
Yeah. So the city of South Portland will not let us do that. So our efforts to try to make recycling there is fraught with all kinds of complications. We have a big dumpster that all goes into the landfill. Yeah. But the biggest problem that I'm working on is shrink wrap on boats. Maine is inundated with it. My boat is sitting in my yard at the moment covered with shrink wrap. And I've been talking to Ocean Access Max in Rhode Island about this. And the term um, cyclic, cyclic, I can't say it, it's cyclic circular recycling so that this particular plastic might hopefully be able to be reused by turning it back into the same material for boats. Yeah. And his recommendation right now, because we really can't recycle it, um, it has to be clean, it has to be taken off specifically there's something about the type of plastic that makes it difficult to do that there'll be a lot of education with the public that needs to happen and and it sounds like it is the ball is starting to roll but i kind of have the bit in my teeth on this to keep pursuing what are we going to do with the mountains of shrink wrap that we use on boats um, i would like to see you <laughs> stay on top of this as well and if you can keep us informed or keep me informed on what's happening i would really really appreciate it we're going to try to encourage people to reuse their shrink wrap on the boats which apparently you could do like for up to seven years the tricky part is we really need uh, the people that apply them to give them more room so you can get it back on sure and I don't know uh, how well the education and the cooperation will be um, to have it done because obviously it's going to cut down their business if we're reusing it. But sure. there's work to be done here and I'm trying to get educated, which is why I'm here. Sure, so thank great. you. All I have thank to say you. on that. Thank you. So just to, to respond to, to all of that, um, I would check in with there's a company called Green Machine. They are a recycling company. They only focus on recycling, I believe. So um, they would come to you. You would, I think, rent uh, toters, giant containers from them, um, and they would help you recycle efficiently at your facility. Um, you could also reach out to your same hauler and get a recycling dumpster from them. Um, but you know how they dump that and where they dump that, whether it's our recycling building, our waste energy building, I, that's up to them. Unfortunately, I can't make that call. Um, so say, your stuff was like really contaminated and then they had three other stops that were really contaminated and they have like four stops that were really clean. Well, that truck is mostly full of contamination. So they would probably dump it at waste energy. But um, I can say 100% green machine um, will is focused on recycling. So that might be an avenue for you to check out, but also call your hauler and, and get an idea there too. Um, as for the, the wrap, I would 100% say get folks to reuse it. And that should come from, from uh, the, the people having the boats. They need to talk to the people wrapping the boats and say, this is what I want. Cause you're the customer. Like I, voice, we, you know, we, I, I always say to the students, we vote with our dollar. We make decisions based on where we choose to spend our money. So make sure that we're doing, uh, you know, we're speaking our mind. We need to, to tell the businesses that we are choosing to buy from what we need from them. Because if they don't hear, they don't, you know, they don't know to change anything or they don't care. Um, there is an organization called New Day Syria, N-U-D-A-Y, Syria, like the country. Um, and this is not recycling, but they actually take old um, boat covers, tarps, plastic, um, and they actually send, send them to Syria to be uh, made into, uh, what is it, tents, covers, um, you know, things like that. So maybe check them out. Um, they send over huge container loads. So it's not just a pile of plastic that they're sending to them, um, but it's an incredible organization. So um, that's what I have to respond to that. But yeah, make sure all of us, not just the folks who have boats, but make sure you're kind of voting with your dollar. And, and if you have something that, you know, you have a problem with something, make sure that you're saying it, you know, we, we are the change that we need to be. Thanks, Katrina. Of course. I see Tanya's had your hand up for a while. Let's go to you. Hi, Katrina, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, thank you for your presentation. And um, Jennifer, it's really interesting just uh, being on this call and hearing about different 
businesses or nonprofits that are, you know, the challenges that they face. I'm curious what, um, what are the biggest challenges and barriers to small businesses in South Portland? For example, I like work the desk at a yoga studio. I mean, I teach at South Portland High School, so I, I know kind of the ins and outs there, but at the studio, they were just um, saying how challenging it is to do recycling there because they don't, they don't necessarily, like you don't have um, free pickup like you do for residential. Yeah. So how, what's the incentive, I guess, for small businesses to recycle or, you know, how can they do that? Because my guess is that there's a, you know, there's a lot of recycling that could happen at all these small businesses, but, but it's not happening. Yeah, 100%. Um, I mean, they're unfortunately at this moment, it, there's not really an incentive because, mon sorry, monetarily wise, there's not an incentive because, you know, they still have to pay for the dumpster and for the hauling and for the um, drop off. So, you know, kind of the right thing is, is the right thing to do, um, for as far as recycling goes. Um, so I, 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 I think I'll pass that over to Casey as far and, and Troy, you know, to, to talk about small businesses, just cause that's not, um, I don't know. It's, that's just, it's, it's a tougher area. Yeah, no, it, it totally is a tougher area. In fact, that's one of the reasons why Green Machine started that Katrina mentioned earlier. Um, they really see themselves as filling a niche for small businesses. You know, can't really get good service from the larger waste haulers. They're kind of a boutique size company and they specialize in going to, uh, into, you know, small offices or yoga studios that have maybe a lower volume of material than some other facilities. So in, there is certainly a cost associated with it. Um, uh, but that, that's kind of like the kind of maybe first stop uh, to check out. And then, um, yeah, that's, that is, it is definitely more challenging and there is some cost to it. It's hard to, it's hard to get work. Done. The idea is maybe you can reduce your trash collection enough by having more recycling in your business. And it doesn't always work out that way, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I would recommend maybe giving a call to uh, the Green Machine uh, for your circumstance. But I would note that um, one of the One Climate Future actions um, for both Portland and South Portland is to explore uh, mandatory recycling ordinances for the business sector as well. So it's not like on the immediate horizon, but it's something that we have in our plan to uh, take up at some point. So. I also want to say, Troy, that I think another um, strategy that we're going to try to employ through One Climate Future is um, incentivizing like greener business practices yeah. and recycling will probably be a part of that. Yes, please. Yeah, no, absolutely. We've, yeah, we, one of our plans in One Climate Future is to develop, a, like a, because we want to promote businesses that are doing a great, doing great work. Um, we also want, you know, we just want to recognize them um, you know, maybe through some sort of award program that, you know, people can, and with recommended practices to, uh, you know, that can, you know, make the business be more sustainable. So thanks Should for there reminding. there be tax breaks for businesses who have green practices? Mm -hmm, maybe. So that's like a little bit outside of our pay grade at the moment, but, uh, um, but, you know, all, you know, uh, you know, when we do programs, you know, they're, they're subject to public comment and public process. So if um, that were something that, you know, people in the community wanted to, uh, you know, invest their public dollars into that they could, that could be part of it. So, and I think Callie has had her hand up for a while. I'm just saying, can, can you get food and other unwanted out fairly well? Or does some of it get, you know, thrown away because you can't? At the recycling and trash building? Yeah. One, once it comes to our recycling building, all that food is thrown away or anything that's non-recyclable. So say I was on a tour once and there was a pair of LL bean boots in the trash because someone had pulled them off the line and put them in the trash. We don't have a donation bin, a food, you know, compost bin. We just have recycling in the recycling bin and everything else is trash. And then in the trash building, there is no sorting going on whatsoever unless we see, say, a car battery that's dangerous or, you know, something else that we need to pull out that's really dangerous. So nothing is getting sorted and put in a better and higher place once it comes to either of our buildings. That's why it's so important for us at home to make sure we're putting it in the right place. So nothing is, no, no food is recovered here at Ecomain. Once it's in, 
the recycling bin or the trash bin. You know, if it's in the food waste bin, yes, that stuff goes up to agri-cycle or, um, or agri, yeah, agri-energy up in um, agri-cycle energy up in Exeter, Maine. I thought you said sometimes the food gets, you know, put into the recycling and maybe messes it up or something. Yes, yes. So you heard me correctly. So say you Percent. didn't know that food was compostable, you were thinking that it was recyclable. If you put that food into the recycling bin, then yeah. that could, um, you know, kind of get all over the, the cardboard and the paper and everything. And it could, depending on how, you know, how much was in there and how long it'd been in there, that could ru ruin the recycling. So then that would have to be pushed to trash, but we can't take that food out and okay. then, like save it and compost or anything like yeah, that. That's, that's, that's too yeah. bad, obviously. It, it's mm -hmm. really, really a shame, which is why, you. you know, when I see things like LL Bean Boots, <laughs> in the recycling bin or cardboard in the trash, I think, why, you know, let's, let's make sure we're putting that stuff in the right place in the first place. Yeah, the, right. And with oh, the, the Hanks. Uh, hi, um, my name is Lee, I'm from Portland. Um, we, a question came up amongst uh, several of us um, last, earlier this week about whether the, um, the people that are picking up our trash are, um, um, they, it seems like they pick up the recycling and the trash at the same time. How can we be assured that that um, recycling is actually getting recycled? Troy, can you take that and then I'll answer after? Sure, I can. So, um, so it absolutely should be um, getting recycled. That's our expectation. Um, we do have, um, a, we have a truck that has a split body that can take you know, both trash and recycling in the in the same truck and it's separated. Um, I don't know, um, you know, I, I didn't see your specific um, circumstance, but that's certain we do have that vehicle uh, on the road. It's because it's, it's, it's Sella is the people that are picking up our trash. Okay. All right. Um, so they have is a split body. Yeah, that's exactly right. So each so they take, how it works is the, um, you know, the first will grab the cart and, and, and tip that into the back. And if you see in the back, yeah, it has got two different pieces. So then they take the bags and put it in the other side of the truck. And then when it goes to um, Eco Main, it will drive, you know, first down to the waste energy plant and only the trash side of the truck, truck will dump out. And then, um, and then it will go up to the recycling plant and dump out the other part of the truck. And, Maybe Katrina, because other towns do, do that as well. So maybe Katrina can fill in some of the details there about how. So we can feel very confident that this is being done properly. Absolutely. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. That's really helpful. Yeah. Yes. No, we, we get that question pretty often. Good looking out, though, because, you know, I've heard people um, say that and I ask them, you know, have you looked back or have, you know, have, have you seen a, a split body truck? And, um, you know, if they, if they notice it's not a split body truck and things are going in trash and recycling are going in, definitely call the city because again, like Troy said, that shouldn't be happening. Um, yeah. I've heard that that could happen if it's say like a terrible blizzard and it's really unsafe for the trucks to be out and they just want to get it done. You know, that might be a situation where it could happen, but otherwise it really should not be happening. So, so good looking out on that. Uh, but no, Troy was definitely right. Uh, you know, I was doing with my hands like this, uh, the split side truck one side will open and that's trash. There's literally a line down the truck. So the trash can't get in the recycling, the recycling can't get in the trash. So the trash will get dumped out. They'll go up to recycling, the recycling will get dumped out. So just like that. Um, and a fun um, fact is that all of our trucks are weighed when they come in. So say the truck is full, um, they weigh it, they go and dump off the trash, they come back, they weigh it. So they know how much trash they dropped off. They go dump off the recycling, they come back and they weigh it. So they know how much recycling they dropped off. So we're keeping, really well, really good track of every single truck that comes through our gates um, and how much weight was in there, where it came from. And again, like I showed that that giant, I went through it quickly, but the giant kind of spreadsheet of all the contamination, we're, we're writing down the kind of junk that's coming in. So we can do more targeted education of say, oh, well, this neighborhood is giving us a lot of diapers or, you know, a lot of bedding, you know, some something, just pick your, pick your contaminant. Um, so that's really fun. Thank so you. We literally, we literally get... We literally get a report every month from EcoMain about the recycling and how in each load it totally notes if you know what percentage um, was had contamination in it. So we they and so we get that feedback and are able to uh, do education. If you know there's a route like oh my gosh too much trash in that load, we can 
target, you know, EcoMain did some, you know, tagging that we worked with, and that's been really successful. So, but having that level of detail about where the where the contamination comes from is is pretty helpful. I did want to mention um, you mentioned you saw you saw a Casella truck in Portland, and um, so you'd see that we actually have some city trucks doing trash and recycling pickup, and we have some Casella trucks just because. Um, it, it's been really hard to get a lot of, you know, staff shortages are a problem for lots of industries right now, and including uh, municipal governments. So we have a, we're collaborating with Costella. We hired them to come in and help support the collection here in Portland. So it's kind of- oh, We're actually in a condo. Oh, you're in a condo. Okay. No. Um, so yeah, so you guys hired them yourself, but we also hired them <laughs> for city, for city pickup. So. Great, um, thank you. One thing I want to mention, we talked about, um, you know, the waste hierarchy or the reducing and reusing recycling. And so um, one option that we can really take advantage of is if you have good, you know, we mentioned the bean boots that maybe went into the, into the wrong uh, waste stream, they could have been donated uh, to, um, a, to a nonprofit. Or we also have uh, retailers and stores that specialize in getting high quality used, um, gear or goods um, and they can help create more circular economy by taking high quality items and you know circling them back to people who can use them so and see that jenna from woods and water gear was a store like that or it's so maybe jenna you can introduce yourself and uh, and what you do to help reduce waste uh, by repurposing really good quality outdoor gear thanks troy Thanks, Katrina. I have a question for you after too regarding uh, fabrics. But okay. yes, I own and operate Woods and Waters Gear, which is a consignment store. We're in Brunswick, Maine. It's not too far from Portland. We have a lot of South Portland customers come up here. But yeah, we see the value in the secondhand market. We're specifically outdoor focused. So it's a lot of synthetics, um, base layers, snow pants, you know, a lot of skis, snowshoes this time of year. Um, and a lot of kids stuff too, which is really nice because I think most people have all kids stuff lying around because kids grow out of it so fast. Um, but yeah, we, we're focused on high quality, but we also try and encourage our customers to, you know, if there's a nice wool shirt, we try and encourage them to mend it. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, we're trying to do more programming with that and having people repurpose their current goods because it does last longer. Um, but it's a great... It, Brunswick's great and I'm sure South Portland and Portland are similar. I'm, I just don't have my business there, but um, a lot of people are open-minded and into the reusing factor. And I think, you know, Katrina or Troy, if you guys could give me some paperwork here, you know, the pamphlets, I would love to pass those out here. Um, oh, yeah. I think when you find the bean boots in the trash, it's just, it's the easy way to go for some people. And it's, um, I know like Goodwill has had the problem, I guess the opposite problem where they find trash with but her off. dropped off. But um, but yeah, always come to me if you guys have any outdoor gear and I'm happy to try and you know work with you. And we do also work with nonprofits here in Brunswick, um, high schools in particular to try and get gear out to kids to make them get outside easier, which is great. Um, and, oh, I'll go ahead with your question. Uh, Sorry, and then Katrina, question for you. So we do get sometimes I'll, I'll take in some people's stuff that I just can't resell and it is cotton or wool. Um, it's just really ripped up and even I can't repair it anymore. Is there anywhere we can send 100% natural fiber fabrics to be recycled? So two suggestions for you. Um, Goodwill seems like a weird choice, but they actually create rags for say boat yards and auto body shops and things with um, material that they just can't sell that would be a good kind of rag material. So it could be upcycled and reused into that. Um, you know, just put it in a bag, say anybody has a shirt that st are stained that nobody wants to wear and you don't want to throw them away. Um, you know, put them in a bag and say, you know, for rags, things like that. Um, but also there's a company called Apparel Impact. Apparel Impact is a great place to recycle fabrics and textiles. Um, they have those drop-off locations, um, kind of like you used to see with Salvation Army and things like that before they all got really gross and um, you know over trashed. Uh, but check them out. Um, I don't know their exact locations, but um, check them out. They do recycle textiles and they do a great job. Thank you. So absolutely no natural fibers in the recycling bin. 
no, no, never. We cannot take anything. Um, you know, even the composting places don't want that because it's not going to really break down. Um, so no, we cannot take any textiles in the recycling ever, ever, ever. We can take paper, plastic, metal, glass, and cardboard. That's literally all we can take. Um, and just an anecdote there is we had a, I think it was a what, Troy $4 million fire over the paper um, screen when either wood or um, fabric got stuck in the stars and then combustion, fire, paper everywhere. Um, yeah, it was a mess. So, you know, we get the wrong stuff and it really causes a, a problem, not just like an, oh, that's a, that's a bummer, it's in there. So we definitely want the right stuff. And as far as getting uh, brochures and other information at your store, great. We can definitely do that for you. Um, Brunswick, knocking on desk here, hopefully we'll become a, an eco-main community here in the near future. Um, I think maybe a, a letter of intent was signed and we're really, really hoping to bring Brunswick on board. Uh, but yeah, we can definitely get you some of those for customers that come in, but just know that Brunswick stuff at this point doesn't come to EcoMaine, but you know, folks come from, to your store from all over the place. So yes, we can 100% get you that stuff. Holden, you've had your hand up for a long time. Oh, I keep getting my questions answered. So um, <laughs> no, no big okay. deal there, but um, I did have a, a quick question for Jenna, just if, if you could just quickly speak to some of the offsets um, that go with reusing textiles, fabrics, gear. Um, I think that's super interesting. And a lot of times we don't really highlight like the impact of reuse as opposed to oftentimes we highlight the impact of recycling. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, apparel, I think, is from my research is one of the biggest um, waste. And it's, you know, you've sent things to Goodwill and a lot of times it, or Salvation Army, you know, it ends up in other countries. Um, so even just trying to keep it here in the circular piece of it, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and now we're seeing too, which is tragic, is the um, a lot of stuff is being locked up in ports and not you know from other countries for when you buy new so i think it's kind of nice to see that eye-opening piece that you know do we really need to buy this stuff coming from other countries a lot of people are starting to look here and locally and see how they can use their items longer um and i also it's nice too because you see a lot of people investing more in you know wool products which have a higher price point and that's just for the fact that they can mend it and it lasts longer um, and it's nice to see all generations doing this. We have Bowdoin College right down the street from us and a lot of kids are you know, looking into mending things. There's a couple of kids there that make their own um, apparel that they sell to other people on campus from stuff that they will repurpose here. Um, so it's, it's a lot, there's a lot of, um, it's interesting. It's kind of like a new, a new world that I'm seeing. It's a small world, but it's a new world in here to see all the generations reusing and repurposing. It's pretty cool. Totally. Um, I just shared, um, if, you have, if you're not familiar with Recover Brands, I don't know if they're a, a brand or a company you might be able to work with to reuse fabrics, but they're a cool company that are in that space. So anybody who's interested, definitely check them out. I use them when I want to make shirts for fun events, US made. It's really cool stuff. So yeah, and there's there's some you know you know major clothing and out you know gear outfitters that really focus on longevity and reusing and repairing gear. Uh, you know Patagonia certainly is is one of those. I don't know if there's anyone from Patagonia on on the call today. I know they have a shop in Freeport that does repairing um, of Patagonia gear. So they don't want you to throw it out. They want you to bring it to them and help it get restored and and back on your, you know, back out, how so you can enjoy it on the outdoors some more. So um, I think reuse is a super important part. And like Holden mentioned, we don't, it doesn't get enough press and, and uh, you know, we, it's harder to track from a like, municipal government perspective. We, you know, we don't get to have numbers about people reusing or, you know, sharing and repurposing stuff. Um, it doesn't show up in our waste stream. So, but it's super important, it's, you know, the high, it's higher, you know, better use of material than recycling it. So keep keep doing that. And you know, places like Woods and Waters and in Portland is also the Portland Gear Hub that accepts donations. They really try hard to get you know, gear to kids and you know, people who may not be able to afford um, a lot of expensive gear, so they can also go and enjoy the outdoors here in Portland. So, um, so yeah. So you know, keep reusing. Sure. And I think Tanya has her hand up. Hello again. 
Oh, Jenna, I I teach an ecology class at South Portland High School, and we're talking, we watched the movie Fast Fashion recently. And so my goal is to have a um like a school-wide panel discussion around it. So maybe I'll reach out to you to see if you'd want to come speak about the work that you do um, at my school. Um, so Katrina, this is another question and I was just thinking about the, you know, I do recycling composting at South Portland High School and the, one of the biggest challenges is composting milk or recycling the milk containers. Are there any companies that compost milk? Like so that the, the containers can be composted versus recycled? Holden, any idea? Yeah, so um, I'm happy to speak to this. I'm, I'm from AgriCycle, so we manage, um, Troy, you can talk to the actual percentage, but I would say the large, vast majority of the food waste that goes to EcoMaine, we pick up. Uh, we turn it into renewable energy and organic fertilizer and extra main through a process called anaerobic digestion. Um, I'm also, also a commercial composter by trade, a product of the Maine Compost School. Um, went to UMF, studied composting there. And this is something that I've experienced time and time again while trying to educate students and working in public schools around food waste composting and those strategies. The challenge with milk cartons in particular is a lot of them have a plastic film um, around the paper, which makes it increasingly difficult to both recycle if you wanted to recycle the paper, as well as um, have it break down during the aerobic or anaerobic uh, process. So um, that thin plastic film that goes around the containers makes that the most common challenge. Um, it's also not, uh, you know, we can we can compost or anaerobically digest the milk, but uh, the milk carton itself is, is the real challenge. And oftentimes it's not a value add for any process. So oftentimes we'll have, you know, students Drop, uh, dump that into like a five gallon pail and then pour that into the composting bins for us to collect. Um, and then if, I, can Katrina, can you speak to the actual recycling side of things? Is, how does yeah. that work for you? Yeah, so just know that your, um, say your orange juice containers, your broth in a box, soup in a box, wine in a box, little milk cartons, those are all recyclable. Always make sure that they're empty. You know, we don't want your milk sitting in the comp, uh, sorry, in the recycling bin and then in the truck and then on our floor because we don't want that smell, that gross, you know. But as far as the recyclability of it, whenever all that paper is pulped up, think of just like a giant blender in your mind, but you know, obviously way more technology than that. Um, but the the fibers of the paper are able to be separated up from the plastic. So it's actually um, uh, separated out. So the fibers of the paper are recycled. The plastic itself, the plastic coating or poly coating is what it's really called. Um, that's, that's done away with, that's, that's junk. Um, but the paper is able to be recycled. So um, the, the milk cartons that come to us, orange juice cartons that you have at home, et cetera, um, you know, obviously make sure they're empty and then those are recycled, but just make sure they're empty. I, I guess the challenge is, my question really is how can we, encourage companies to make it co totally compostable because all of the milk that's at the high school is really challenging to recycle it because it means that a person has to go through the recycling and make sure like a you know a student custodian whoever and and it's just been one of the more problematic things that I notice you know at the high school in terms of recycling and composting and it's a lot it's a huge amount of um, milk that's yeah yeah you know yeah, it's kind yeah. of hangs out in the bottom. Um, you know, I think one of the issues is that a compostable container might not contain the milk for as long as it needs to be contained. I think that's probably the biggest issue when it comes to, oh, well, why, why can't we make this milk jug or milk carton compostable? Holden, you have something to add to that? Yeah, and, and something to remember is, um, and again, the folks at EcoMain can speak to this as well. Compostable ware isn't necessarily a value add. They're oftentimes single use, well, they're all single use items um, as opposed to recyclable materials that can be recycled. So um, we just want to make sure that while we're looking at compostables as a way to decrease the amount of contamination at compost sites, it still can increase contamination at recycling sites um, in those processes through uh, wish cycling or essentially just not knowing where it might go because they do look very similar. Um, that said, you know, we face a lot of challenges with packaging at 
AgriCycle as well because we have uh, a depackaging unit. Um, so we work with EcoMain to send them our contamination in our composting or in our anaerobic digestion process through the depack. Um, but I did just share a link about the packaging laws in Maine. So essentially what's happening is we want to pressure lawmakers to ensure that uh, producers are not just passing the buck to consumers. Uh, like you're saying, you know, this is a challenge for the people who really, really care. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a, it's a decision that needs to be made at a corporate level. So um, there's some really awesome stuff happening in Maine to pressure uh, policymakers to curate policies around this exact topic. Well, I kind of, kind of build on what Holden was saying there about the uh, Maine's uh, first in the nation um, since, you know, producer responsibility law for packaging. So, um, and this is something both the city of Portland and South Portland testified in favor of, and EcoMaine did as well. Um, so we have a, passed a law and the government and Governor Bill signed it that it's going to require um, manufacturers and packagers to help pay for the costs of disposing and recycling their goods. So that will, you know, again, reduce some of the costs for the local government, but also provide some incentive for the producers to make their products more recyclable or more reasonable because that will, you know, it will cost them less in the long run to do that. So currently they don't really have much incentive to, uh, to do that because they're, they have no skin in the game, so to speak. So they don't care how much it costs to recycle or to dispose of it because they're not responsible for that. But this new law and the rules are being hashed out at the DEP right now, but it's going to uh, pass those costs back to the producers. And, and so they'll, you know, again, be incentivized to do a better job. And Maine's a real leader nationwide on that, on that particular policy. And you have your hand up, Jeff, or we're getting close. I want to make sure you get your chance to get in here. I know, and this is a big question. So I do not understand how burning plastic is a good idea. It seems like a lot of air pollution and doesn't change the carbon footprint, takes a lot of energy to burn it. Can somebody help speak to that? I'm gonna go back to screen share just for a hot second because I can show you a little something right here. So in the grand scheme of things, no, you know, we wish we didn't have to burn plastic, but it's either that or going to sit in a landfill for the next however many years. Um, and plastic doesn't really break down in a landfill, but the food does and um, uh, cardboard and other organic materials do, you know, that are in there with the plastic. So, you know, a regular landfill like Hatch Hill or Old Town, et cetera, they're not a safe place for material to go uh, because of fires, leachate, uh, pests, um, you know, methane production, et cetera. So waste to energy is just another way to deal with trash. And yes, we're burning plastic um, as well as anything else that comes into your, from your trash can. This is kind of general of how it works. And again, I didn't share this because I, I didn't want to take up too much time, but this is in the PowerPoint that I'm going to send everybody. Um, but this is a process of what happens to your trash. So you make trash, whether it's a, a plastic bag, which of course we hope that you take back to the um, grocery stores like remember Canifords, Target, Walmart, etc. will take plastic films, bubble wrap, air pockets, um, sandwich bread bags, produce bags. There's a lot of things up there that you can actually get out of your trash into a bin at the grocery store to go off to turn into decking or other materials. So just keep that important thing in mind. You don't have to throw away all your what we call flexible packaging. But anything you do throw away, you know, a pen that broke is plastic. You know, we're just talking about plastics that you can't recycle in any way, shape, or form. You put them in the trash, they come to us, they get burned here. And then this is where the pollution control starts. Right here, we're taking out the nitrogen oxides. Uh, right here, we're taking out the mercury dioxins and furans, which is really a, a big thing that is created whenever you burn the plastic. Right here, we're removing the sulfuric acid um, and other acidic gases. And then right here, we're removing the particulates that are created from burning the trash, which are of course the teeny tiny things that make up smoke. So we're doing an incredible job of dealing with the pollution here before it leaves our stack, because I don't, you, you can't really see this and I can't move this, but what this says is water vapor um, comes out here and from the clean flu glass, flu gases. So again, we are allowed if you can see my fingers here, we're allowed to emit a certain amount, but we are always emitting way down here. So we could emit here. We're like, nope, we're good. We're good down here. 
Um, and I actually have a, I can find it just really quick because I really don't want to take up too much of your time, but I've got so many presentations here and what I just did one for someone and it had the pollution in it. Here it is. So just to give you an example, as far as the cleanliness of our, um, our air coming out. So dioxin spherins, this is a, a, one of the big things that are created whenever you're burning plastic. So we're allowed 25, 25 units. As of 2016, of course, it's just a little bit older, but we were doing 0.4 and 0.2. Um, we um, uh, installed a couple upgrades too. So even 2019, our numbers were allowed, you know, say this is lead, we were allowing 400 units, we were down at eight and five. So yes, it's not amazing that we're burning plastic, but you know, it's, it's better than the alternative of it sitting in a landfill forever and we're making electricity um, and you know, this, this, and this. Are we perfect? No. Are we doing a great job? Yes. I think that, and that's a really important question because there's a lot of, you know, a lot of discussion in the environmental community about, you know, is, you know, is waste energy better than that filling? And certainly zero waste is our goal and, you know, we have a long way to go. Um, but I've always been very impressed with EcoMaine's um, emissions control program. In fact, there's a, they have, a, EcoMaine has a scientist on staff named Ann Hughes who totally is on top of all this. And I think that would be a really interesting opportunity to maybe to talk to Ann because uh, she is so knowledgeable and uh, she loves doing the research on this, on this stuff. So maybe that's a future topic is Ann talking about the, the, you know, the technology behind this energy. Um, oh, that'd be really fun. I'd yeah. go to that one. <laughs> well, did you want me to talk about ash landfills for a minute? What, what specifically did you want to hear about? Just, just their management impact, how it varies from uh, a normal, you know, dump or, or landfill, um, kind of the pros and cons of it. Oh, sure. Great question. Troy, are we okay to keep going just to, for another minute? I'm going to take that as yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so just go back here. Just I like visuals; they're really helpful. Um, go, go, go. So here's our ash landfill. This is it close up. We're filling a cell. You can see the um, the lining on the bottom. There's lots of other layers underneath here, so it's not like it's just grass. And then we threw a tarp over it, and then we put the ash on there. It's like PP, uh, HDPE layer, which is like this, which is plastic layer. But there's also sand, gravel, clay, um, drainage pipes filler, you know, there's all these different layers underneath the landfill that ensure that our ash and anything else is not permeating into the ground here. Um, so we are putting the ash into the landfill from, you know, a truck dumps it off and we get, let's say ballpark 200 trucks in per day and ballpark 10 trucks leave to go to the landfill per day. So again, vast reduction in size and volume. So the truck brings the ash over and then we bulldoze it, swish it down. This ash is not blowing all around because we burn the trash, the trash turns to ash, and then we actually cool that ash off in water. It's called a quenching tank. I think of it as just like a giant bathtub that the water cycles through that, uh, and then the, the ash is being pushed out onto a conveyor belt and any metals is be are being removed by a giant magnet in our building before it comes here. So this ash is wet, it's stuck together, it's chemically inert by this point because there's nothing in it that is going to react with the wind or the heat or the water or anything like that. So this is the, the landfill a little bit farther back. Um, you know, it's not, it's not this. This is a typical landfill. It's not an over dramatization of it. It's, this is like literally what a landfill looks like. I went to one in Wisconsin for a college field trip um, in let's just say it was 2005 and I still remember it vividly as holy moly it looks just like this. So fires happen here leachate which is the dirty water that is mixed with all the trash can seep down sometimes that leaks into the groundwater. Rockland is actually dealing with this from a um, they filled a, a quarry with trash back in I think the 40s and the taxpayers are still pumping water out of the landfill because they don't want it to leach into the other groundwater. It's a huge mess. So proper 
lining of landfills is incredibly important, but also proper management of the landfills and also the trash before it gets there is incredibly important. So it's, um, and uh, it's, I could talk about this for, for so long, but um, did, I, did I touch on what you wanted to, Holden? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for all that. And I think um, it's just good to know because a lot of times we we forget that uh, there are there's a landfill at the end of it, you know, though it's filled with ash. Uh, there's a lot of benefits. Um, oh, it's as to go somewhere for sure. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, that's why we we teach the as as um, Troy mentioned earlier, you know, the waste hierarchy. We want you to try and reduce, reuse, recycle and compost because it's still going to a waste or energy building, which is still going to the landfill. We want to fill up that landfill as slowly as possible. Um, we're estimating that our landfill is going to fill up in the year 2045 or so at our at our rate of um, production right now. That's that's not great. You know that's that's good, but that's not great. You know we 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 don't want to fill it up that soon. Uh, but to give you an idea, Hatch Hill, which is one of the pictures that I showed you of the of the, the real landfill, the whole trash landfill, they're going to fill up in the next five years or so. So yeah. we're doing pretty good. Uh, yeah. so, you know, and, we need everybody's help. Mm -hmm. And wastewater from those landfills is a huge topic in Maine right now. There, yeah. it's sure. yeah. If you haven't, do do some research on it. It's significant in the Kennebec. So, so well, one thing that I think poor people in Portland and South Portland and the eco Maine communities can be really proud of is that all of the waste that are produced by our communities is handled inside our communities. We're not shipping waste to other states. Um, so, you know, we're handling it all right here with our waste energy plant, with the recycling plant, and with the Asheville. So it's highly unusual to have a campus like that, that so that a region is able to handle all of its own waste. It's very, very unusual. And, you know, hats off to our predecessors, you know, decades ago who decided that that is what they wanted to do. Um, so you know, th this is a great topic, and I think we're going to have to do another uh, waste management and recycling uh, uh, program in the future because it is so interesting and there's so much to it and it's I really think it's you know, people are interested because you know we all deal with this every day so it's something that we're all personally invested in so um, yeah thanks everybody for coming today stay tuned we're going to post um, information on the oneplanetfuture.org website including the recording so if you want to hear it again or if you no um, friends and colleagues and associates who would be interested, uh, they'll be able to watch it too. So again, and Troy, thanks. We'll be to, oh. we'll be able to put the PDF of, that I'm going to send you um, on Definitely. there too. Great. Cool. Sure will. Yep. Um, so again, have a great day and thanks again for joining us. And we hope you'll join us again for another Coffee and Climate. We do them every month. So see, you next, see you next time. Have a great Bye. day.